excited to continue the series that Pastor Dave started two weeks ago called His Name Shall Be Called. And uh, two weeks ago, Pastor Dave opened up the series and talked about the wonderful counselor. And then how many of you guys were here last week for Rabbi Jason Sobel? What an amazing message. Uh, I was joining the streaming army last week as I was down with the plague, but I am back among the land of the living. And uh, man, what an amazing message about God's heart for the Middle East and a timely message as well. So if you missed that, I encourage you to go online and check that out. But we are gonna jump back into our series today. And so if you have your Bible, how many paper Bibles do we got in the room? Come on, Napa East Bay, Roseville. Come on, all the locations. Uh, turn with me to Isaiah chapter nine. And we're going to read our key text for this series as we jump in. If you don't have your Bible with you, good news, it's going to come up on the screen. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Would you pray with me as we jump in? Father, we thank you so much for the house of God. We thank you for your word, we thank you for worship, and all these things that can seem just like things we do at church and things we do as Christians, places we go as believers. But today we say, God, that we choose to step into the arena of faith. God, not, we don't walk by sight, but we walk by faith. And so God, the words uh, that, we, that we hear today, God, and uh, all that happened in worship, and even just coming to the house of God, I pray that today you would move in people's hearts and in their minds. In Jesus' awesome name we pray, amen. Amen. So I don't know about you, but um, every time I read Isaiah chapter 9, no matter what time of year it is, I always think of Christmas, right? It could be May, but my Bible reading plan is sending me through Isaiah, and I read, for unto us a son is born, right? A child is given, uh, and I go, oh, it's Christmas, and it might be May. Anybody else with me? Like, you read those scriptures, and it's, you try as hard as you can. Okay, I'm just going to tuck away the Christmas music that I'm thinking in my mind right now, I'm just gonna read this for what it, and it's just Christmas. And I think it's just because I love Christmas. Anybody else love Christmas? Okay, all the locations, right? You can respond. Um, let me qualify that question. I'm talking about how many of you listen to Christmas music starting November 1st? You are a Christmas lover. It's like a Jeff Fox where these kids, you might be a Christmas lover if, okay. Uh, how about this one? How many of you guys set up your Christmas tree long before Thanksgiving? Like I'm talking about like not even the week of Thanksgiving. It's already up before then. Come on, you can be proud. Come on. Christmas lovers. I love Christmas. And I thought what a, what a great way to open up this message on the week before our Christmas services than to share some of my Christmas memories with you. Here is my first Christmas, 1983. That is uh, Diane Zwanziger, the leader of the prophetic. How about a little boy in a fire truck? It doesn't get much more Christmas than that. And then 1987, it snowed in Fairfield, white Christmas. Anybody remember that? We had a white Christmas in Fairfield. It was crazy. And then here's 1988. Little did I know that my future wife would be celebrating her first Christmas that year. And uh, here I am putting out the vibes. And I uh, got my Nerf bow and arrow this year. I loved Christmas. And then sledding with my dad uh, and in the snow. I mean, this is, these, are, these are memories. But if you asked me then... What I, I would never think is that in this moment, that today I wouldn't be as close with my dad as I thought I would be. And many people in the room today, at all of our locations, you would bear witness with this, that life happens. Stuff happens, and it goes from all the fun Christmas memories and sledding, and we're always going to be together, to then just sometimes things happen. And it doesn't turn out like you thought. And for many in the room, you've walked through divorce or maybe many, even statistically we'd know, maybe you've never even met your dad. Uh, for some of you, your dad's passed away recently or in recent years and you, all you have are memories at this point. You don't have that, that interaction anymore. Whatever the case, I know I'm talking to humanity. This is a humanity thing, right? That life happens. It doesn't always look like the Hallmark card. It doesn't always look like what we saw it going like in our minds. And, uh, and that's just, that's what happens. But I do wanna, you know, even though it doesn't look like I thought it would look, I do honor my dad uh, because he raised me in the house of God. He served our country in the U.S. Air Force. Uh, he prioritized my education and got me through school. I, I love my dad and I honor him, even though we're not as close as I thought we would be in this season. But as I thought about this series, Isaiah chapter 9, 
He's the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, everlasting father. And I knew I was up to preach. I was like, I am not touching everlasting father. And here's why. Not because of anything in my situation, but because it is such a loaded topic for so many. And as people, as broken humanity, it's hard to hear about an everlasting father without superimposing our experience with our earthly fathers, right? Like, you can't help it. There's, there's happy things and there's wounds and there's good things and there's bad things and everything in between. And so uh, it's just, it's such a loaded topic. So I dug in, like, deep on mighty God. I had so much research done, theology ready, Hebrew words ready to share with you today. And uh, I, so I, you know, kind of one of those, like, okay, I'm trying to be a team player here. So I presented it to Pastor Dave and our team on Wednesday. And I was like, hey, guys, here's, Here's where I'm thinking of going, just ready for them to be like, my, that is the most brilliant thing I've ever heard about Isaiah chapter nine. And in their wisdom and brutal honesty, they said, I'm not feeling it. I was like, that's so cool. Because I've got nothing on everlasting father. And immediately in that moment, I just knew, I'm like, this is going to be a loaded topic. So I dug back into research, and even theologians, the crazy thing is, is there's in, in all the commentaries and all the research, there's not a lot of content on the everlasting father. It's like, they're like, yeah, he's the everlasting father. Let's move on. And so I'm like, oh, great, I am dead this weekend. Like, this is not gonna go well. And then it hit me. He's the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father. Anybody on the planet that believes that there is a God believes that he's mighty. But very few believe that he is with them, cares about them, and could be an everlasting father. And this is the mystery. This is the, the beauty of this pronouncement of who God is in this passage and why it was such a mind-boggling juxtaposition of the power and the might of God and yet the nearness and the intimacy and the care and the love of an everlasting father, and so that's what we're jumping into today, because I know that there's so many that, that you've maybe even felt this. It's like, God, I know you're in heaven, and I know you're powerful, I get it, but is he here? Because I see so much in life, and so much in the news that would suggest that he's not. But let's not forget another Christmas scripture, two chapters before this one, in Isaiah chapter seven, and Isaiah said this, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgins shall conceive and bear a son and, his, uh, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. He is the wonderful counselor who is with us. He's the mighty God who is with us, but he's the everlasting father who is with us no matter what we see, no matter what we feel, no matter what we go through today. Come on, he is with you and we should never forget that. So back to Isaiah chapter nine, verse six, four. To us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It's so powerful, right? He is the all-knowing, wonderful counselor. He is the all-powerful, mighty God, but he is the eternal, never-ending, everlasting Father. And I think back to my story, and again, for many of you in the room and at all the locations today who, again, life has happened, and your relationship with your earthly father is not the picturesque thing that you wish it was. But in that time, what, a scripture that carried me was Psalm 27, verse 10, and it says this, even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. Now, my, my mom and dad didn't abandon me, okay? I just wanna make that very clear. But the picturesque version of the family that I thought I would have, that abandoned me. That fell apart. That changed. Life happened, and we just roll with the punches. See, so, in fact, my mom is here this morning, and I honor my mom. Uh, in fact, I honor, I honor her mad Polaroid skills. Did you notice that she caught a father's son sledding in the snow on a Polaroid Camera, perfectly framed, no blur, I am in awe. So mom, I honor you for that, and so much more. But though, the, though my mother and father, this system, that picturesque thing, the Hallmark card, may abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. And I was thinking about in that time when all the, everything was changing and just it was obvious like, okay, it's not gonna be like I thought it was gonna be. 
I remember driving to school. I was going to Sac State at the time, and I was commuting. And I remember one night driving right there at the 50, 80 interchange, and I was like, God, why, why has this not, like, shook me to my core? Why, why didn't I have to go to Pastor Dave and say, I just need to take some time off because nobody would blame me. You know, if you talk to all the psychologists and things, it's like walking through a family rift and all that is like, it's, it's a big thing that causes people to have to take some time and, and to slow down and just kind of center yourself again. But it's like, why didn't I have to do that? And it hit me because the Lord had hold, held me close. Because I was like, well, I, it was encouraging to me because it's like God said, because you have a relationship with your heavenly father. And no matter what happens with your earthly father, I will hold you close. Though your mother and father abandoned you, I will hold you close. See, when you have a relationship with your heavenly father, you are less shaken by the things that happen on earth. See, earthly fathers are trying their best, but your heavenly father is the best. And so when we go through things and we don't understand them and expectations aren't met, see, things just, they don't shake you as much when you are planted and rooted and grounded in the love of the everlasting Father, and it is possible for every person in the room. This is what God's plan is for you. And so the, the question that begs itself today then is this. What is the everlasting Father like? What is he like? And, uh, you know, because of our different experiences, you know, we... Uh, we would all look at earthly examples and try to see what he is like, but I just wanna suggest this and really just encourage you today in this is that we cannot compare the heavenly father to any earthly father because they will pale in comparison. He is so much better than any earthly example and so now I'm creating new memories with my family as a dad. Oh, why did they have to grow up? Everybody said soak up every moment, and I've been trying, but they're not that little anymore. And uh, we tried to do that picture, and it put me uh, in, you know, traction for my back. And, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just now go like, get off of me. You're going to hurt my back. You know, it's now they're that big. But now, I mean, life is crazy, isn't it? It's like you have your memories, and then stuff happens, and the next thing you know, you get to start making your own memories. And, and I'm just like, God, help me not to mess this up. Right, I, I just, uh, I, I wanna say to all the dads today is be humble, cut yourself some slack. You are not gonna be perfect, nobody is. And pray the prayer I pray all the time. God, let my shortcomings not mess my kids up for the rest of their lives. God, please, God, please, right, amen? So what is our everlasting father like? Because we can't just ignore this title of God. It's all through the word. It's all through scripture. And knowing God as our father, and you need to get this, knowing God as our father is immensely important to our understanding of and our relationship with him. We have to know God as the everlasting father or we will miss who he is, what he is like, who he is. And so uh, the Bible says this. Jesus actually said this, Matthew chapter seven. He said, if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Everybody say, how much more? Will your heavenly father give good gifts to those who ask him? So Jesus is speaking about a different context, but the greater kind of the, the overarching theme here is very applicable, and that is this. If you earthly fathers, other translations say sinful or evil fathers, are like this, how much more your father in heaven? Like at our best day, how much more God? So in comparison to God, the best dad on earth, I don't know who the best dad on earth is, but if, it's, if you're in the room, congrats. Uh, maybe the mug was true and uh, you are the world's best dad. Congratulations on that. But even the best dad on the planet would be considered evil with the massive chasm between them and God the everlasting Father because he is that good. There is absolutely no comparison. So how do we figure out what this everlasting Father is like? We don't have time to go cover to cover, but this is why you have the word of God. This is the character of the everlasting father. This is the nature of the everlasting father. This is his thoughts. This is his heart. This is who he is on paper for you to understand who he is. Well, Father, what should I do in this situation? Well, well what, what's, what's your thoughts with what's happening in the world? God, what should we do in election years coming up? God, what's your heart for our nation? God, what's your heart for my life? 
All of the things that we need are contained in these scriptures. This is how we learn who the everlasting Father is like. So if you wanna know him, make it the aim of your life to study and give time and priority to reading his autobiography because that is what the Bible is. This is why we are big on this in our church and Bible reading plans and biblical studies programs and everything that we can do to dig into this because ultimately it's learning who the everlasting Father really is. So, we don't have time to go cover to cover today. I almost did, but we don't, I, I you know, just determined against it. But I do wanna look at one passage in, this, in, in the Word, and if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 15, and uh, this is the story of the prodigal son. You would, you would know this, but we're gonna read it in the context of what we're talking about today. And it's, in the context of this, it's like the disciples asked Jesus, hey, what's the everlasting Father like? And Jesus could have pointed to the patriarchs. He could have said Abraham or David or any of them that they would have honored and known and been studying for all their lives. But instead, because he knew that even the best dad on earth would pale in comparison to the everlasting father, he said, I'm gonna illustrate this using a story. And so before we go into this story and we read the prodigal son, anytime you read stories like this in the Bible, you have to ask yourself a couple questions. Number one, who is God in this story? So in the prodigal son, as we read this, he is the father in the story. That is God, and that's why we're reading this story today. And then we need to ask, who am I in the story? Who, who do I relate to? And there's two sons in the story. One is a, a son that asked for his inheritance, left home, turned his back on the family, lived a crazy life of drugs, alcohol, prostitution, all these crazy things. It's all there. We'll read it. He, he literally just goes away, lives the craziest life, turns his back on the family, and then realizes he isn't where he should be and, and, and says, I need to go back to my father. So that's one son. Do you relate to that son today? Have you, you know, kind of been living life on your own and getting involved in all kinds of things that maybe you know are not the best, but you just, you're enjoying it for a season maybe, or maybe you can't get out of it, you want to, or whatever that would be, but you know I'm that son. Well, there's a second son too, and he's one that didn't leave the house uh, but he was wrestling with this whole thing. Either way, I hope that whoever you are in the story, you meet the Father in a fresh way today as we read this story. So let's turn to, the, to Luke chapter 15, and let's read this. This is gonna be a, a decent passage of scripture, so I'm gonna fuel up. Because eggnog makes it all better. I'm just kidding. Could you imagine? If I drank eggnog, I'm like... Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> all right. Now you're less you know, excited to go to breakfast. So good, we're here for a little longer now. We'll get another one. <laughs> Luke 15, verse 11. And he said, there was a man, this is Jesus telling the story. There was a man who had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had, took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found and they began to celebrate. Now, his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he's received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. The father came out and entreated him, but he, his answer, uh, he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. 
But when the son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you're always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this, your, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. I'm gonna give you four things that we learn about the everlasting father from the father in this story in Luke 15. Number one, the father accepts us as we are. It says that while the son was still afar off, it didn't say that he was far away, took a shower, changed his clothes, brushed his teeth, really got as, as good as he could because he knew he needed to present himself to the father. No, it said that while he was afar off, the father ran to him. The father accepts us as we are. See, religion says this, clean yourself up, maybe you'll be accepted. But see, the everlasting father says, no, 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 you're accepted, we'll work on all the stuff later. Come as you are, I accept you as you are. Here in this room, at East Bay, at Roseville, Napa, Prison Church Network, anybody watching online, he accepts you as you are. Don't wait. I've heard this so many times. People go, well, I gotta get my stuff together before I can come to church. It's like, no, 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 that's religion. Our everlasting Father who loves you unconditionally says, no, just come as you are. We'll work it out. But just come. Don't stay away. See, if, if one of my sons were lost, like lost to the point where I'm freaking out because I don't know where he is and we, we've been looking and we can't find him, you know? Like parents, you know this feeling where you go from cool to like not cool, if he was lost to that level, but then we found him, I wouldn't care what he looked like, what he fell in, uh, you know, what he smelled like, if he fell in, you know, the sewer or whatever, I, I don't care, I would run and embrace him. And if that is my heart as an earthly father, how much more the heart of the heavenly father? Why do we think that we gotta go get our cologne and get showered up and get cleaned up and get our 401k in line and get our education and get yourself out of the stuff that you got yourself into before you can come to the father? You can't do it without the father. So come, because he accepts you as you are. See, we see the filthy rags. He sees his little boy, his little girl. We see ourselves as the mistakes that we've made, but he sees us as his son or daughter that he is so proud of. And we see every reason why he should not accept us, and he sees every reason that he should. This is the everlasting father. Number two, the father's heart is filled with joy when he thinks of us. The father's heart is filled with joy when he thinks of you. It's easy to see, oh, well, when he thinks of, of Christians. No, when he thinks of you. Well, surely that can't apply to me. I mean, I think he's God, so he probably knows what happened last week, probably knows what happened this morning before church. I mean, Pastor Dave probably... You know, he's full of joy when he thinks of Pastor Dave, but not me. No, no, the father's heart is filled with joy when he thinks about you. See, the, the son in the story, he thought that God's heart would be full of anger and punishment and like, how dare you do this? How could you do this to me and turn your back to me and, and do all that you did? And he, he would have agreed. So think of the heart of the son when he's afar off, rehearsing his, you know, apology, and the father is running towards him. He threw a feast. You know what the feast represents? A party. It's, it's rejoicing. God rejoices when he thinks of us. Romans 2, 4, check this out, because the, the father didn't validate what the son was doing. Like, the, the son didn't come, and, and he went, you know what? I don't care what you did. I just love that you're here. No, he cares what he did. He doesn't want him to keep doing those things because he know, as a good father, he knows that it won't lead to his best. But he, he, the acceptance and the joy of his son coming home overrode all of that. But look at this, Romans 2, 4 says, the kindness of God leads you to repentance. Man, in our humanity, I know this to be true for me, maybe this is true for you. I'm like, no, no, like the, 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 the beating that I deserve from the Lord will lead me to repentance. And when you mess up, you're like, I deserve it and that's gonna fix me. But isn't it crazy how the character of God is this? It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. Because when you're afar off and you're a mess, 
and you're at, at your wit's end. You're at the end of your rope. You have no other options. You want to come crawling back to the Father. I don't care what punishment I deserve. I don't care, you know, if I'm out in the fields. I don't even get to live in the house as long as I'm home. When the Father overwhelms with acceptance and overwhelms with joy, it changes everything. It is completely unlike anything on earth earth. And I love this scripture, Zephaniah 3.17. It's one that we talk about in the worship world a lot, but Zephaniah 3.17, here's the heart of the Father for you. It says, he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love, and he will rejoice over you with singing. When God thinks about you, yes, you, it's rejoicing. That word for rejoicing means to spin around with violent emotion. Like So when he thinks of you, yes, even on your worst day, he is full of joy. Why? Because as an earthly father, you know, I, I say this to my boys if I'm putting them to sleep, I'm like, I'm so proud of you. Well, why, Dad? Because you're my son. Well, but like, but what are you, I'm like, I honest, like the fact that you were born and you're breathing and I kept you alive, I'm proud of that. <laughs> First kid, you're just like, oh, Lord. First birthday, you're like, we did it. We kept this kid alive for a year. That is an accomplishment. We can't even keep plants alive for a year. But, you know, the old saying, they're your pride and joy, right? My kids are my pride and joy. How much more the everlasting father, you are his pride and joy. Yes, on your worst day, but God, look what I did. I don't care. You're a kid. What do you expect yourself to do? I love you. My heart is filled with joy because you are mine. So the father accepts us as we are. His heart is full of joy when he thinks of us. Number three, the father gives us what we don't deserve. The father gives us what we don't deserve. See, the son, when he took the inheritance early, in that culture, it was literally like spitting in the father's face and saying, I would rather that you would be dead. Give me what is mine when you die. I want it now. You're dead to me. And he turned his back and left and went the other way. It was rebellious. It was disrespectful. It was just, I mean, the most vile thing a son could have done to a father in that day. And so when he came back, think of the, the weight and the guilt of going like, I don't even have what I asked my dad for. I squandered it all. I lost it all. And maybe you're in the room today or at one of the locations and you're like, I know that feeling. I had it, squandered it, wasted it, lost it. That marriage, those kids, that business opportunity, I messed it up. But what happened in the story? The son comes back, and what does the father say? Bring the ring, bring a robe, and bring sandals for his feet. Okay, I guess. Are those the Christmas presents you open and go, yay, Aunt Edna sent me a robe. Here's what those represent. The ring represents, it would have been a, like a signet ring. for a, like It had the family seal on it. This is like, oh, he's a part of that family just because of the ring. The ring would have been something that's like, you know, that's how they wrote checks, right? They put it in wax and it's, it shows, that, okay, this is an authorized uh, you know, letter or money from that family. So this son that squandered it all, the dad said this, no, 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 put the ring on his finger. I'm restoring him to the power and the authority of this family. And he said, hey, get the robe. Now, I'm not talking about the one you took from the hotel last time you were there that they washed a thousand times and it's like exfoliating every time you put it on kind of robe. I'm talking about, like, this is like the best robe. He said, no, no, put it on him. What does this do? This represents restoring him to the class that the family was a part of. And then finally, it said, he said, bring the sandals. Put the sandals on his feet. Why? Because servants didn't wear sandals. Sons wore sandals. So when he said, bring the sandals and put it on his feet, because remember, the son was content. No, no, I'll be out in the, the, the slop again, but at least I'm at my dad's property. And he said, no, 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 you're not a servant, you're a son. He restored dignity to the son in that moment. This is the grace of God. How many of us, we go, I don't deserve this, but the everlasting father says exactly, welcome to the family. God, I'm just glad to be saved. I don't deserve to be free of addiction. I, I did this. Well, you're my son. You're my daughter. 
So you do deserve freedom and the breaking of addiction. Welcome to the family. God, I've invested years into messing up my relationship. Well, I'm better than you think. Watch what I'm gonna do. Welcome to the family. God, you've given me so much. I'm good. Help other people. I'm good. Oh, the father would say, you ain't seen nothing yet. You're my son. You're my daughter, and I'm gonna give you some stuff you don't deserve. Welcome to the family of God. Psalm 68, six says, God places the lonely in family. Romans 8, 16, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. So he accepts us as we are. His heart is full of joy when he thinks of us. He gives us more than we deserve. And number four, when we come to the Father, he runs to us. When we come to the Father, he runs to us. So why do we wait? Why do we wait to come to the Father when he is this good? I, I think about it with my sons, and uh, especially our youngest, you know, uh, he's really tender, really sensitive like this, and so I think of him when I say this illustration, and that would be like, if he came to me one night and he says, Dad, I'm sorry that like, I didn't spend more time with you this week, would I be like, yeah, you're right, actually, get away, and I need you to go to your room and just think about that. I want you to think about how good you're gonna be when we're together, and I need you to think of all the things you're gonna do for me when we're together. No, I'd be a horrible father, right? As an earthly father, I would be like, come here, and I would hold him so tight and go, just the fact that you even are thinking about this and that you're sad that you didn't, want, that you didn't spend time with me, I'm like, oh, my heart, so how much more the everlasting father for us? See, I, even prepping this week, I'm praying to God and, you know, through illness earlier and just, you know, life and things that happen, I go, God, forgive me for not coming to this place of prayer like this more often. And he said, Joseph, I am so excited that you're even here. And it's just those feelings of, you know, self-condemnation just leave and you just go, oh, because the Father is that good. When I come to him, he is running to me. When you make any feeble attempt to turn and to come to the Father, he is running to you. If we could only understand his heart when a sinner turns to him, if we could only glimpse the smile on his face when he thinks of us, if we could just feel the embrace of the Father for even our most feeble attempts to come to him, it would change everything. I'm gonna ask Pastor Rich to join me uh, on stage and we're gonna get ready to land the plane here and uh, all the campuses, campus pastors, you guys can take it from here and get ready for a ministry time. But God is here to restore some people to family today. Again, whatever your earthly concept of your earthly father is, just push it away and let's focus on the heavenly everlasting father today who loves you so much, who accepts you as you are, whose heart is bursting with joy when he thinks of you, no matter who you are today, whether you've been in church your entire life or this is your first day in church just listening to this, your heavenly father loves you and if you have yet to give your life to him, today is a great day to do that because he wants to welcome you into family. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna end by singing a song called Run to the Father. And uh, it's a song that we don't really sing on the weekends. Maybe you've heard it on you know, Christian radio or whatever, but um, even if you don't know the song, I just want you to worship with us in this. And I don't want you to stop there. Um, I really believe that there's, there's power in movement. Okay, there's power in movement. And as we sing this, if you're in the room and for any reason, you feel the, the Father drawing you and you just wanna run to the Father, I just wanna encourage you to come out and worship with us down here in the front. And I believe that's a powerful sign to God and, and that he'll meet you in this place. It's one thing to intellectualize messages, it's another thing to respond. We've got time, we're good, don't miss the moment, but let's run to the Father as we sing today uh, together, come on. with me. I've carried a burden. Oh, and I've carried a burden for too long on my own. Because I wasn't created to bear it alone. Oh, and I 
hear your invitation to let it all go and I see it now I'm laying it down and I know that I need you I run to the Father I fall into grace I'm done with Son for redemption, the price for my heart. Come on. Oh, I don't have the context for that kind of love. I don't understand. I can't comprehend. All I know is I. Come on, make this your cry today. I run. So I run to the Father, I fall into grace, I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait, my heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend, so I run to the Father again, come on, sing it again, I run. Love me, come on, church. Just begin to respond to him. Oh, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Father. Thank you for your heart to me. Oh, my heart has been in your sight long before my first breath, and running into your arms is running to life. I run to 